All right, guys, our next guest, <laughs> he left the corporate world to start a photography business in his uh, native land. And then in the summer of 2014, he founded Black Donkey Brewing. Welcome, Richard Sibbery. How are you doing? Good, Dieter. How are you? <laughs> okay, here. Uh, tell me a bit. Uh, Black Donkey Brewing in the west of Ireland. How did you yeah. get together to that idea? Well, uh, as you said, I was working a corporate job. I'm I'm from east coast of Ireland, just north of Dublin, but I was living in New York for about 20 years. And um, I met my wife over there. Uh, we, you know, lived along in New York for a good number of years. And around about 2012, she decided that she wanted to move home. So uh, we started putting plans in motion to move home. Um, I had worked in the corporate world and I left that and I was working as a photographer and I was a fishing guide and a few bits and pieces and a beer drinker, had always been a beer drinker and a home brewer. And one thing I noticed coming home to Ireland over the years was that the craft beer scene in, in the States was growing by leaps and bounds. It was getting, you know, a bar where at one point you might have had a choice between Coors and Molson and Miller and Budweiser. Now you had 50 taps, maybe even too much choice. But when I came back to Ireland, you had no choice. The same three beers that were being served from north to south, from east to west, when I was, you know, just old enough to start drinking them were still the same three beers that everybody in Ireland was drinking. And uh, so I said, maybe there's an opportunity here to start a brewery. And at the time, I think there was about 12 independent breweries in the country. And um, so in 2000 and... Yeah, December 2012, I landed back in Ireland and we put the wheels in motion, looking for a premises, looking for equipment, uh, branding, what were we going to brew, what was everybody else brewing, that kind of thing. And in 2014, uh, we actually started brewing, I think it was in about July 2014. And uh, the rest, as they say, is history. Now, I think by the end of 2014, there were about 25 breweries in Ireland and now there's somewhere close to or maybe even a bit more than a hundred yeah. so the craft scene also kicked off there um you started then with a farmhouse ale a saison that was uh, everybody in ireland said you were crazy for doing that uh why is that yeah well it was you know the, they the great days of starting a brewery are the few months just before you actually start a brewery when you drive around and you you know you visit all the other brewers and you taste what they're brewing and and you exchange stories and you listen and you, you you garner information, you know, and everybody was brewing, even in 2014 in Ireland, the, the holy trinity, a stout, a red ale and a lager or something that passed as a lager. And, you know, I having come from New York, I asked people, where's the big IPAs? And the, the response was, no, no, Irish beer drinkers aren't going to drink big IPAs. No, that's not going to happen. And I said, and where's the triples and the quads and the big Belgian style beers? And the answer was, well, sure, you can get on a Ryanair flight to Brussels for 10 euro and you can buy Belgian beer in Belgium. Why would you brew it here? But, yeah, you know, but the. The beer style that I most wanted to introduce in Ireland, because it was a personal favorite of mine, was a saison. And so the, the general consensus from all the other brewers that I spoke to was a saison is not going to work. Irish beer drinkers aren't going to drink it, but good luck with that. Make sure you have a good stout recipe in your pocket. And uh, so we went ahead, but based on that sort of information, our saison, which is called Sheep Stealer, I have actually one there. Uh, it doesn't say Saison on the label. It says Irish Farmhouse Ale. And we put Irish Farmhouse Ale on it exactly for that reason, because we wanted people to think that this was something a little more approachable. You know, the beer market in Ireland is still very much in its infancy. Now people drink stout, lager, red ale, and IPA. So, you know, the, it's expanded a little bit, but it hasn't expanded a lot in terms of styles. And... Uh, so I just decided that Irish farmhouse ale was more approachable than Saison. You have to go into the small print on the back of the label to see the word Saison. And what was the link between Ireland and a, and a Saison? Well, there was no, you know, at the time there was no real link. Um, I like the Saison because I like beer as a food accompaniment. 
and Ireland, very much like Belgium, I suppose, we don't produce any wine really in Ireland. I don't know if Belgium has, uh, has vineyards, but we're kind of a little bit too far north for that thing. So in Ireland, if you want something to drink with your food, you have a choice of milk, water or beer. And stouts and lagers and red ales, you know, they accompany some foods reasonably well. But a saison really is probably the most versatile food accompanying beer there is. Very simple recipe, very clean, simple flavor, well, complex at the same time. And so that's kind of why I decided to brew a saison. But also, I had it in my mind that Ireland and Belgium, you know, climatically, we're not that different. It's probably a little warmer and drier there, but it's, you know, we're famous for our rainfall here, which is a good thing, really. Um, but otherwise, there's no reason to suggest, I thought, that 200 years ago, maybe Irish brewers weren't brewing Saison style beers. The missing link was the yeast. So Sheep Stealer, which is our flagship beer, the first beer we brewed, it's brewed with a commercial Saison yeast that anybody can get. It's a diastatic strain of yeast, produces the kind of beer that I like. I know diastatic is a dirty word to a lot of small breweries these days. It's created immense problems for a lot of people with uh, packaging too early and subsequent fermentation and bottles and cans exploding. But it's what it's the road we set off on. We knew what we were dealing with. But what I wanted to do was see, could I find an Irish native yeast that would replicate that sort of Belgian diastatic character? And so in 2017, we went out um in fairness, you know, we, we could have picked any location we wanted, but there's a cave not too far from the brewery, and it's very, very famous in Irish mythology. You know, one thing Ireland is very rich in is legends. We have a lot of legends of what happened back in the old days and the Dark Ages and witches and leprechauns and all kinds of monsters. And this particular cave in Irish mythology was said to be the gates of hell. And if you're familiar with the, the Halloween festival, the Halloween festival is an Irish, traditional Irish festival. And it's said that the Halloween festival, or as it's known in old Irish, was called Samhain. Samhain was a festival that originated around this cave because <clears throat> there's a hundred stories surrounding it. But one of the best that I like is that on Halloween, a flock of birds would come out of this cave and they would travel across the country and blow the leaves off all the trees. And that signaled the end of the growing season and the start of winter. Stock up your harvest. Make sure that, you know, your, your potatoes and your barley and everything else is safe and dry for the winter. Anyway, long story short, we went to this cave to see could we find a yeast in it. And down deep in the cave, obviously, we didn't find any holes and bits and pieces that you don't want. But the entrance of the cave is very small. And you have to slide in on your back to get in there. And I'm nearly, what am I, uh, 192 centimeters tall. So, you know, and, and 130 kilos. So for me to slide into the small entrance to a cave, it's not something that I, I make a habit of. But as I was sliding into the cave, right immediately above the entrance, there was a blackberry bush growing. And so I said, let me take a blackberry off this bush and see whether or not there's any yeast on it made kind of sense to me that it'd be a good place to find yeast. So I got the blackberry, we cultured it up, along with some other stuff. We actually got three viable yeast strains, all from that same area, three distinct but viable strains. And um, we cultured up the one from the blackberry. That's the first one that we've worked with. And that created a beer that we call the Underworld Series because the association with the cave and hell and so on and so forth. And it really is it's the missing link if you will because it's a yeast that produces a very belgian kind of character or what the modern drinker would certainly see as a belgian character it's a diastatic yeast um when we you know ensure fermentation is complete now prior to packaging obviously and we take the beer in the trial jar we drop the hydrometer in and if the hydrometer hits the bottom of the trial jar then it's ready i mean it it this yeast eats everything and uh, does it in a reasonably quick time. Like one lab that helped us, um, <clears throat> they cultured it up. They can grow it more quickly than we can. And the biologist in the lab, I called him and I said, you know, how's, uh, how's this pitch come along? Yeah, he said, I'll have it ready for you by the end of the week. He said, I'll tell you, he said, I've never seen anything that grows quite like this before. He said, it's very exciting and a little bit scary too. You know, I had 
visions of this yeast taking over the lab and you know so um after a while we uh <clears throat> i wanted to know what the yeast was and i asked the lab can you uh you know sequence the dna or whatever and tell us what this yeast is and he said no we can't but i know a man who can so it was sent off to a lab in sweden and i heard nothing and i heard nothing and eventually i called him up and i said you know, what's the story? Can you identify our yeast? And he said, no, we can't. It doesn't match anything in the database. So we sent it to another lab with a bigger database and they're going to test it. So anyway, the second lab came back and they said, no, we have, you know, tested this or, or, or typed it against a database of, I don't know how many thousands of strains of yeast. And it doesn't actually 100% match any of them. It's a 95% match for some of them. It's definitely a diastatic strain but it's not something that we've ever seen before. So it's not a new species or anything. It is Saccharomyces cerevisiae vardiastaticus, but it's of a strain or a mutation that nobody seems to have sort of isolated and propagated before. And it makes a lovely beer. And it came from a cave, so, <laughs> so you went to the fantastic. Cave of hell to get your yeast. Yeah, exactly right, yeah. And we, we did a, a series on Facebook. If you go on our Facebook page, you can see all the videos concerning the as we call it, the wild yeast chase, because we went into the cave on Halloween. It was the first day we went in, and we we made a little bit of a film about it and had a bit of fun. And yeah, I won't spoil the ending. Watch the videos on Facebook; it's good. <laughs> I will. I will. Um, and the beer itself, yeah, commercially, it was a, a success. You, it's now one of your main beers in your portfolio. Yeah, yeah, it is a success. Um, ironically, it took you know. I don't think it's a showbiz, show business expression or something that you can never get famous at home. And the beer, the was an Irish newspaper wrote an article about it. It was a fairly small article on a Sunday column about beer. And that got seen by somebody in America who then wrote a bigger article about it, uh, actually in a history magazine about Celtic history and so on, not a brewing magazine. And that in turn got seen by uh, a journalist who writes for the BBC. And she wrote a 2000 word article on it in the BBC travel magazine. And it kind of went on like that. You know, we got contacts from as far away as New Zealand and Australia. I did a, a radio interview with an Australian radio station on it. And sort of when I had all this together, I took all these bits and I took them. There's a, a group that's in, responsible for promoting Irish food and Irish food products. And I took it to them and I said, how is it I can get a live interview on an Australian radio station and I can only get this much in an Irish newspaper? So they sort of put their PR machine behind it and they got us a little bit of publicity and, and it went out into a few magazines. But it's still, amongst the beer community, it's a good seller, it's a great story, but it's it's still a hard sell, you know. Um, unfortunately, a lot of Irish consumers, they just look at it and they're eh, yeah, sure it's just beer, you know. Beer is, is beer. Yeah. Um, Ireland follows the international trends of craft beer. We had the Imperial Stouts. We had the Hazy IPAs. We're now a bit more into lower alcohol beers. Um, is Ireland following those trends or are there any other do's and don'ts in beer styles in Ireland? Yeah, I'd say Ireland is following them fairly closely. Definitely hazy IPAs with, you know, a month's salary worth of hops in every brew. Um, recently, the can has become probably, it's it's becoming a more popular uh, vessel, if you will. We still bottle. Everything goes into bottles. We have our own bottling line here. We bottle condition everything. Uh, we fill it flat, goes into a warm room for generally 10, to, 10 days to two weeks to re-ferment in the bottle. Um, but in terms of do's or don'ts, I don't think there's any don'ts at the moment. Uh, we obviously stout, stout is actually a hard sell as an independent brewer because there is one stout brand that you've probably heard of that really dominates the Irish market. Yes. Um, yeah, it's, yeah, them. Um, there's lager, our primary biggest selling beer in Ireland is a Dutch beer. It's a lager that, again, you probably know their name, um, kind of like Voldemort to me I don't say it because if I say it three times they might appear you know but um so lager is becoming more popular definitely lower alcohol but Ireland is always certainly compared to the states or Belgium Ireland has always been a low alcohol kind of country five percent beer in Ireland is considered a strong beer and 
unlike the US, but like most other EU nations, I think the tax on beer in Ireland is based on the alcohol strength. So the stronger the beer, the more the tax. So the stronger the beer, the more expensive it is when it gets to the consumer. And there is also still a big session mentality among Irish drinkers. Um, it certainly existed when I was young. It still exists today where Saturday night, 10 pints, 10 pints is what people want to drink. And so you're talking a pint, uh, 500 and what is it? 560 mils over half a liter. And guys want to go out and drink eight or 10 of them on a night. So if those are strong beers at seven, eight, nine, even 10 percent, that's going to be it's going to end badly or it's going to be a very short session. So I think the craft brewers, you know, we did mimic the US and Belgium and places like that and brew strong beers. But the core range is always going to have to be something session strength between four and five percent. And there's even a few independent brewers uh, experimenting with alcohol free beer at the moment. What are some things that we could never expect from a Black Donkey Brewing? Hard seltzer. <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, I don't think you can ever expect a big, hazy, juicy New England style IPA. I like to drink them, but there's so many of them out there right now. It's almost impossible to stand out. And I have to be entirely honest with you. 95% of them taste exactly the same to me. Certainly after the first one, they all start to sort of blur the lines a little bit. Um, I happened to mention that to somebody who brews a lot of that style of beer. And he started telling me stories about the wrong keg being hooked up to the wrong tap and nobody noticing, not even the brewer. And, you know, one hazy IPA to another. And it's kind of, I think it's that's almost like an arms race as well. People are chasing rarer and rarer hops and hops are getting more expensive and that sort of thing. So I really like very traditional style brewing. Let the malt and the yeast speak for itself. We grow great barley in Ireland. Um, yeast is an over, I think is an often overlooked component of beer. I can brew beer without barley. I can brew beer without hops, but I can't brew beer without yeast. So, you know, yeast is very important to us. Um, and we brew as well. <laughs> Actually, we were kind of thrown a, a, a curveball a couple of years ago when we started the brewery here. We had a water source that was very hard and alkaline. You know, we could have opened a, a second business selling calcium flakes that we scraped off the inside of the hot liquor tank. But we adapted our recipes to suit the water we had, which is kind of my understanding of how traditional brewing centers came about. You know, hoppy beers in Burton and Pilsner beers in Pilsen and all sorts of points in between. Um, and about two years ago, we started noticing that all our numbers were off. You know, mash pHs were off and extracts were off and everything. So, so, something was not right. And we generally send water samples away to the lab twice a year to get them tested. And um, there had been talk in the area that they were going to do something to the water supply because there was a, an issue with cryptosporidium in some parts of the water supply. And they were going to put in a UV filter. I said, well, a UV filter isn't going to change the water chemistry, but it turns out that the UV filter wasn't working. So the water authority, what they did was they just tapped into a completely different water source that is now soft and acidic. And literally overnight, it just, our beers just went, I don't know, what the hell's going on here? But it kind of showed as well how important the water is in brewing. And of course, you can run your water through a reverse osmosis filter and then tailor it to any style you want. But I like to work with the tools that we're given. And so we had to adapt all of our recipes. Ironically, the saisons, probably the least of all, they seem to come through with minimal sort of impacts. But anything that was had a, a hoppy character, because we did one or two, I call it, a, it was just sold as a pale ale, a beer called Happy Out. Um, and But realistically, it was a dry hop saison. Uh, but again, for consumer friendliness, it was sold as a, a pale ale. It was very dry and crisp and that. And when the water water uh, character changed, we haven't, I don't think we've been able to get that beer quite back to where it was two years ago. Um, but I'm going to brew it again next week. So, you know, this is uh, another attempt at that recipe. Um, but other than that, uh, I wouldn't say there's nothing we don't do. We, we did an experiment 
started two years ago, I think. We were contacted by a distillery. Um, it was actually very encouraged to hear the story, how it came about, of a very, very significant whiskey distillery. Uh, they do a series of whiskies that have been aged in uh, casks that formerly had beer in. They do an IPA one and a stout one. And somebody down there said, oh, we should try one that's been in a barrel that has had a saison in it. So they said, okay, who do we know in Belgium that can do us, you know, fill 10 barrels for us or something like that? And somebody said, you don't need to go to Belgium. You can go up to Roscommon. Black Donkey does a great saison. I'm sure they'd be, be happy to work with you. So they sent us up uh, a dozen barrels and we filled them with Sheep Stealer, our saison. Mm -hmm. And these barrels came off the emptying line onto a lorry. They came to us and we filled them with saison 48 hours after. Now we... We decanted, I think, about eight liters of whiskey out of these barrels before we filled them. Because my theory was um, we got to keep the beer. And once the beer had had its contact time in the barrels, then we sent the barrels back to the distillery and they could do with them whatever they needed. And my thought was the Saison, is a, it's a fairly delicate beer. And if there's too much whiskey in it, it overpowers it. There's nothing we can do about it after the fact. We can add whiskey, but we can't take it away. So anyway, we took out these about eight liters of whiskey and um, put the Saison in it. It had two weeks of contact time. The beer went from 5.6% to 8.5% alcohol. So it pulled, yeah, it pulled 3% alcohol out of the wood. And then we put it in a cold tank and we let it, let it lager for probably about six weeks. Just let it settle down and whatnot. And then we bottled it. Uh, we called it Sergeant Jimmy, uh, and it's become a seasonal brew. Uh, Sergeant Jimmy, it's named after a donkey. So the beer was bottled on uh, the 11th of November, 2018. It was 100 years after the end of the First World War to the day. Mm -hmm. And I was looking for a name, pertinent sort of a name concerning a donkey. And there was a donkey uh, after the, I believe it was after the Battle of the Somme. And a donkey foal was found in no man's land after the fighting had stopped and the allied soldiers took this donkey and they raised it up and it became kind of a regimental mascot and they uh, gave it the rank of sergeant and called it sergeant jimmy so consequently we called our barrel aged saison sergeant jimmy and that beer has been an absolute sensation uh we only brewed two thousand liters of it the first year and it was gone in a flash so we did double that batch uh, in 2019. And I think we're going to do the same thing again this year. It's been exported to France. It's gone to Italy um, and it's sold very well wherever it's gone. So uh, that's kind of a new, a new standard for us. And I wasn't, I was always thinking about doing something with barrels, but I didn't have an idea what I was going to do. And then when I got this call, can you fill 10 barrels for us? And I said, yeah, when do you want me to fill them? And I said, next week. I went, oh, okay, we'll give it a shot. And, Again, a lot of people said, yeah, it stays on in a whiskey barrel. No, it's going to overpower it. It's going to ruin it. But the, the key was the two weeks contact time. It took all the character it needed, but it didn't dull the character of the beer. And it really was fantastic beer. Cool, cool. I hear a lot of um, storytelling in, your, uh, in what you set up at the brewery. Is it already catching up then for tourists? And is there, are people visiting you from all <laughs> over the States for, for the... Yeah, that's... Uh, that's a bit of a sore subject. Um, so the building we have, we're in rural Roscommon. We're close to nowhere, uh, which is kind of nice because it means the rent is cheap and, you know, there's lots of birds and it's the countryside and all that. But uh, we have a big building. It's 570 square meters. So it's a pretty big building. And it's on a main road. And my idea objective in the beginning was that we would create a bit of a visitor center and we could attract some tourists and we'd have a tap room and that sort of thing but when i got planning permission to put a brewery in this building i think the first condition on the planning permission was no tap room or visitor center so you know that kind of was a bit of a fly in the ointment there but i figured we'll deal with that subsequently but in ireland it's very, very difficult for a brewery to get a license to sell or serve beer direct to consumers. Uh, there was no class of license that permitted that up until about two years ago. And so we as a group of brewers, we got together and we lobbied the government to try and get this license created. And they created the license, 
but it's so restrictive and the paperwork process is so arduous that the license, which actually costs 500 euros a year, we've spoken to lawyers and engineers and people like that. And the consensus is to go through the application process for this license will cost between six and 10,000 euro. So as a result, we have done nothing really to develop a visitor center. We do get tourists. We've had some big groups in here. We've had some events in the brewery, but strictly speaking, we can't sell or serve alcohol to any of those people who come through our doorway. And you can imagine a tourist who visits a brewery having a drink is probably quite high on the agenda. And the fact that we can't do it legally, you know, it's, uh, yeah, amazing. it's an irritant. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then you started to make a distribu distribution deal better um, with Aldi. Of all supermarkets yeah. to distribute your beer more. How did that go together? So last year, Aldi put out a kind of an audition, I suppose you might say, for um, independent producers, small producers across all categories. You could be a baker, you could be a brewer, a butcher, whatever it was, to um, to look for some new Irish independent produce to put on their shelves. And we answered the call. Uh, we submitted some beer to them. And we did one uh, sale. There's 140 Aldi stores in Ireland, I think. And last year we sent them some beer and it went into their stores, but we didn't make the final cut, so to speak. We didn't get a permanent listing out of it. But, you know, it is what it is. We kept on going. It was never really part of the business plan to, to supply supermarkets. I was more inclined to want to supply independent, especially retailers. But in Ireland, there's not many of them. So the supermarkets, if you don't sell in supermarkets, your outlets, your routes to market are very limited. So this year, as the COVID pandemic was approaching, uh, Aldi, I suppose, to help support the independent retail or the independent producers that had worked with them last year, they contacted a few of the breweries. I think we were one of three breweries they contacted and asked, could we supply beer uh, for a sort of promotion, Irish independent producer promotion during the COVID lockdown, which we did. Uh, I'm expecting to get results from them this week as to how well that beer sold. And I'm hoping because the reality is the supermarkets are probably 80% of the, the retail market in Ireland. I'm hoping that if our sales results were good enough, they might come back to us and offer us a permanent listing on the shelf. Yeah. And did you also notice that you get more and more people wanted to buy your beers then at bottle shops and order it in bars because they know it from the shelf of the supermarket. Yeah, I think that probably does play quite, um, brand recognition is massive and brand recognition is very expensive, you know, as a small independent producer, there's only two of us in the brewery most of the time. And in fact, for the last eight weeks during the lockdown, I've been here on my own. Um, so, <clears throat> Yeah, it's it's very difficult. It's it's hard work to be brewing and packaging and selling and doing all the other bits and pieces that are required. So if we can partner up with a big national retailer who can put us on shelves in 140 shops, get our brand recognized, then absolutely. But curiously, the other side to that is the supermarkets, they run on a very efficient model. They work on very thin margins. And generally speaking, they're going to put the beer on the shelf much, much cheaper than the independent retailers can. So the the trade-off can sometimes be that if your beer is on the shelf of a supermarket, the independent bottle shops will turn around and go, ah, oh, well, you're a supermarket product now, we don't want you in here anymore. And that has happened in the past. Um, we're still here, we figure a way around it, but uh, there, there can sometimes generate a little bit of resentment too that you're dealing with the big boys and not the local independents. But around here, in our immediate catchment area around the brewery, there are no local independents. We're in rural Ireland. We have Irish, English, German supermarkets to choose from and virtually no local independents. So, you know, we have to do what we can. Yeah, indeed. Um, but you only give some beers of your portfolio towards Aldi, then, I assume. Yeah, so <clears throat> the promotion um, that we just did was with Sheep Stealer which is the flagship, that's the Saison or the Irish farmhouse ale. Um, three, it's actually, it's more than three years ago. Uh, I was, I, I 
took my motorbike for a spin. I went down to Switzerland. There's a friend of mine who runs a brewery down in Switzerland, <clears throat> White Frontier Brewery, Chris Trainer. If you've ever come across him, great guy. He's an Irish guy working in a brewery in Switzerland. So I went down on the motorbike to see him one summer, take a little holiday. And I went down through Belgium, of course, and I went to uh, where the DuPont Brewery is. <clears throat> but it was a Saturday. There was nobody there. It was closed. But I went and I had a bit of lunch. I had some moule and some frites in a, a little bistro there in a the village. And because I was on the bike, I wanted to have a beer, but I didn't want a saison. I didn't want something strong, 7% of that. So I said, um, you know, what have you got that's a little bit lighter? And they had a Pilsner that they brew there. So I said, all right, we'll try it. And it was very nice. Uh, in fairness, I enjoyed it. And when I got back from that trip, I said, uh, we should consider making a lager. If DuPont can make a lager for local consumption, so can we. And um, so we did. And effectively, our lager is a very, very similar recipe to Sheep Stealer, but obviously fermented with a lager yeast, fermented cold. And because it's not a diastatic yeast, we end up with about 4.2% alcohol as opposed to 56 in the farmhouse ale. So that lager was initially intended primarily for local consumption. It's called Western Warrior. It was only available in kegs. We didn't ever bottle it. And last year, it was our biggest selling product. It actually exceeded everything else in draft only. Um, so it sold more in draft than Sheep Stealer sold combined draft and, uh, and bottle. So, so last year, a distributor in the west of Ireland in a very big tourist area he asked if we could bottle that lager for him and uh, put a different brand on it, his own brand for sale in the tourist bars and so in the west of Ireland. And I said, OK, you know, we'll give it a try. And it was for me, it was an interesting experiment because I didn't know if people would buy a bottle conditioned lager. You know, when you think about lager, you think about something that's absolutely gin clear, perfectly see through and so on. And a bottle conditioned beer is never likely to be that. But anyway, we tried it. And yeah, we sold a bit last year. Uh, this year, we hoped we would double it. But unfortunately, now, I don't think we're going to see any tourists in the west of Ireland this year. So I'm not sure that we're going to sell much bottled lager with the tourist brand. But what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to see if I can, you know, something like that Western Warrior Lager would be a fantastic beer for a supermarket. Because in the bottle form, they're not competing with anybody for it. It's our most widespread uh, draft beer. So bottle sales, I think, will boost draft sales. And similarly, draft sales can boost bottle sales. So that's kind of the pitch that I've got for uh, for the supermarket groups in the coming future is something exclusive. The independent bottle shops don't feel put out because it's not something that they're going to compete with anyway. You know, it's being small is it has its disadvantages in terms of mass and and that, but it also means we can be very flexible in some things. We can be infinitely more flexible than big breweries. So, you know, hopefully that'll work out for us. Because this year, after the last eight weeks, pubs are still not going to be open for another month. I don't think we're going to see tourists. And some pubs won't even open. In the village that we're in, there's five pubs, and three of them have already said they can't reopen under public health guidelines. If people have to be two meters apart or even one meter apart and somebody on the door and somebody on the door of the toilets and table service and no paying at the bar and all this, small country pubs can't do that. So, you know, we're we are going to lose a large part of our market this year. Are you focusing more on export or what is the percentage of exporting that uh, black sheep, uh, black, sorry, black donkey brewing is doing? So last year, I think export accounted for about 15% of our of our turnover. And I had hoped this year to increase that significantly. I thought that was going to be our biggest growth avenue in 2020. Obviously, right now, that's not happening. Uh, and every other brewery I speak to around the country is in the same position, even some of the big ones. Um, <clears throat> some of the big ones that have presence all across Europe they're struggling right now to find routes to market and export. Our Italian importer, they obviously they disappeared almost completely for a while there because they were very hard hit with the COVID. They have recently kind of come out of lockdown and, and we've reestablished contact, but their market is still very subdued. Um, we put a fairly good amount of time and effort into developing France. France similarly hard hit. Uh, our importer over there is, they're still, you know, they're not doing any business. Um, 
and what I'm hoping on one side is, because there has been a big push in the media in Ireland, is support local. Support your local independent producer. Shop local. Stay local. Stay home. You know, it, it's good for local business, but also if it keeps people in their home area, hopefully it, it helps prevent the spread of the disease. But if the same initiative is being taken in France and Italy and the markets that we export to, then, you know, Irish beer is going to come fairly low down on the order. So I think the export market for this year, if we export anything, I'll be happy, but I'm not counting on it. You know, Russia was also, Russia actually accounted for the bulk of our export. Um, and yeah, I haven't heard from the Russians in a while, so I don't know what's going on over there right now. And do you also deliver then more towards your end consumers? Uh, what we see in Belgium, that brewers now deliver beer bottles in their native uh, villages. Is that also something you're now doing to keep up uh, with the losses of uh, sales? Um, I'm not legally allowed to deliver beer to my end consumers, so I have to say no to that question. <laughs> <laughs> no, all right. Again, uh, it's... <laughs> In Ireland, as a manufacturer, our license is a wholesale license and the minimum volume that we're allowed to sell to a consumer or in any one transaction is about 21 liters. And even though Irish beer drinkers are big volume drinkers, you know, trying to get somebody to buy 21 liters of beer in, a, in one order is, is easier said than done. So it's... Yeah, well, I, I'll just, I'll say no to that question, but, uh, you know, read yes. between the lines. Yes. Um, any collaborations that you plan to do this year in terms with other brewers uh, around Ireland or the world? Yeah, uh, we have one coming up, actually. We're going to be bottling it this week with a, an Irish gypsy brewer called Hopfully. Uh, Hopfully is two Brazilian guys. They, I'm not sure how long they've been in Ireland, but they've been brewing for probably the last three or four years i suppose and um they came to me a while ago they they do a lot of ipas and uh, you know that kind of thing uh but they came to me a couple of weeks ago and they said we want to do a saison we want to do a proper saison with a diastatic yeast and all that and uh, we want to do it in a brewery that knows how to handle it and how to deal with that sort of thing so uh, we collaborated on a recipe. The beer was brewed. It's been sitting in a conditioning tank for the last uh, couple of weeks. And it's scheduled for bottling on Wednesday this week. And curiously enough, we actually, we did. We just came up with a name today. It's going to be called Rome Free. Rome as in R-O-A-M, you know, as in wander around. Uh, because it's brewed with our wild yeast. And also it will be being released just as our sort of COVID lockdown is being lifted. So people are able to actually get, get out, leave their houses and go shopping and do all that kind of thing again. So uh, it's a, a fairly, uh, you know, like a table saison. It's tipping the scales at about 5%. Um, it's lovely and light and refreshing, going to have a nice high carbonation. We've had absolutely fantastic weather for the last two months. Anybody who's been out of work, the gardens are done, the fences are painted, the houses are painted, everything's, you know. We got, if we had to go through a lockdown like we did, we got very lucky with the weather. You know, if this had happened in November or December, it would have been a very, very different end result, I'm sure. But um, if that weather continues, if we have a good summer this year, you know, Rome Free is going to be a fantastic beer to have. I'm going to put it in 500 ml bottles. It's going to be a great barbecue beer. And curiously enough, in the six years or so that we've been brewing, that's the first collaboration we've ever done. So I don't know why. You know, it's just, that's just the way it's worked out. It's, yeah, it's first time. So who knows? Anything's possible. Yeah. Uh, final question. Is there a definition of craft beer? And if yes, what is it for you? <laughs> Has anybody come up with a sensible answer to that question? I guess you ask everybody. Um, what's craft beer? I don't think there is a definition, but for me, it's the soul. Like some people's, in, certainly in the early days when craft beer was an unknown thing in Ireland and people were slowly developing a taste for it and the standards of beer coming out of the, the small independent breweries and probably us as well, you know, the standards were all over the place. It was good, bad and everything in between. And um, 
I jokingly say, certainly when people are here visiting the brewery, I love to show them around and give them a tour. And, and uh, we usually take about an hour and a half to show people around the brewery. And I say, you all know that, that uh, the craft beer tastes. And people go, oh, yeah, yeah, the craft beer tastes. And I go, yeah. I go, that's the blood, sweat, and tears that goes into every bottle that we brew. It's a uh, craft beer is about passion. It's about heart and soul. It's not about mechanization. Our brewery is 100% manual. We mash in by hand. Every bag of barley is lifted up by hand, poured into the mash tun. We've got a big, about a two meter long mash paddle to stir the mash tun with. Every pump is manually operated. Um, but if I had a million euro and I could buy, you know, a fine Belgian or German made machine that I could run from my iPhone, I'd be perfectly happy with that. It wouldn't change the beer coming out at the other end. Um, to me, it's yeah, it's about the the heart and soul that goes into it. It's about the passion of the brewer. It's about the integrity of the company behind it. It's beer first, business second. Now you have to realize that it is still a business, and brewing just for the sake of brewing is not good business sense. We all want to be here in six months, six years, ten years time, producing fantastic beers for our fantastic consumers. But it's like I say, I never let an accountant see my recipes. The accountant can see the books, but the accountants don't get to see the recipes. You know, I know guys who've, who've thought they had a fantastic opportunity and they've gone over to a massive industrial brewery that set up a craft division and they've kind of been lured in by being told you can do anything you want, you can do anything you want. But every recipe has to go upstairs first. And it's like, well, we don't have this, but we have that. And we can use that. And this one's a little bit cheaper. And if we do this and, uh, and by the time the recipe comes back to them, you know, it's just another dyed lager. And it's, yeah, so it's, it's passion, it's heart and soul, it's grassroots. We are at the very grassroots end of grassroots. But you know, you got like a brewery up in, in Dublin, Whiplash, that's just put in a mash filter and a really fancy kit. I haven't actually seen it myself, but Whiplash are making waves with IPAs. They were fairly early to start putting beer in cans in Ireland, and they've probably got the most technically advanced independent brewery in the country but they're still absolutely a craft brewery no question about it you know i tell people that if a brewer from 200 years ago came into our brewery there's not much that would surprise him other than an electric pump you know everything else is pretty much the same as it always was well electric kettle as well but you know otherwise yeah we do it the old-fashioned way we adapt our recipes to suit the water we put we don't filter anything we don't fine anything we don't centrifuge anything um, we do add a secondary yeast for our bottle refermentation just for consistency sake. But other than that, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's about the beer first. It's the same as the difference between, you know, a loaf of bread from a baker versus a sliced white loaf from a supermarket wrapped up in plastic that, you know, it could have been made a thousand kilometers away. Thank you. Well, Richard Sebery from Black Donkey Brewing some very nice last words thank you very much good thanks